Now, I'm no journalist, and I wanted to see this vast TV spectacular from the supporter's point of view. But with a camera on my shoulder, I wondered whether I'd be accepted as just an average England fan. We'd already been exiled to relative isolation in Sardinia, but for those like me intent on witnessing the greatest sporting event in the world firsthand, a massive security operation had been promised. I'd expected problems getting into some of the games, but I hadn't expected problems getting into the country. Right, we're in Italy. The Italian customs didn't take um, to us having English number plates, I think. And the person who's actually holding the camera at the moment had a very funny Union Jack hat on, and I think they thought we might be English hooligans, for which they're obviously prepared because they had a massive list of, um, of hooligan names that they were checking off, and we didn't come up on it. So after negotiating and being thoroughly searched, we had the car completely searched, we were strip searched. Uh, they finally let us go. I showed them um, the letter I have from the BBC to tell them that we're making um, this program and that um, all the help possible would come in handy and, and basically the guy didn't uh, really care much for that. But it doesn't matter, we're about half an hour, half an hour from uh, Genoa and stay the night there, say hello to some Scottish football fans before getting the ferry to Sardinia on Saturday afternoon. And we're going to see England, Ireland, Egypt and Holland play in Group F of the 1990 World Cup! Yes! Obstacle number two, the quayside at Genoa. If the customs had been unfriendly, the atmosphere here was positively intimidating. It felt like we were attending a summit, not going to watch a few games of association football. Looking around, I was glad to see plenty of others that ignored the hooligan hype and defiantly made the thousand mile drive. It seems as though it's only the English and the, the Irish people that have been stuck at the checkpoints. The Dutch and everybody else are going straight through. through. Are you sure the Dutch least, time? I saw some Dutch being searched earlier. But, but not, uh, not just now, it's all, yeah. all the British possibly, registrations possibly have been might. stuffed. But you, right. Have you travelled through here? Yeah, We've been, I, I've been stopped. Three We've been times. stuffed three times on this car park. <clears throat> Looks like they're searching before going on the uh, boat as well. I'm off. I don't get searched again. Go through all that nonsense. Group over the head style of accommodation, so they've been forced to go to the campsite. And like on the campsites, is uh, no, not much fun. Um, prices on the island generally have uh, increased quite dramatically since the World Cup visitors have arrived. There aren't many amenities. There aren't many uh, social events laid on to the fans. I'd missed Cameroon's brilliant opening match performance against the world champions Argentina, but in a sweaty baggage hold and a two-inch TV, I saw my first game. Italy won, Austria nil. There was no segregation amongst the passengers, no alcohol, no trouble, and there were no cabins left either. I spent a sleepless night on deck and arrived on Sardinia in need of a decent kip. I'd bought a tent in Genoa, so all I needed now was somewhere to put it up. I've been wandering around for about three hours now looking for somewhere to stay. I've just been to one campsite and asked if I could camp there. And uh, she said no. So I fancy getting my tent up, having a shower and watching the football, having a drink and something to eat and a bunk up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean just something to eat. Uh, well, uh, just asked three English blokes if they knew of anywhere wandering around this apartment probably down the road. And a lot of them were really pissed off because um, <laughs> they had, like there were three people who had booked an apartment and they arrived. Oh, I've missed another turn. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, three people are booked into an apartment. 
and found another three people booked into the same apartment. <laughs> anyway, I just found a cab inside. So I'm going to try this one now. <laughs> I'm so tired. The campsite seems to be pretty basic. All right, I suppose, if you're looking for a cheap get away from it all backpacking holiday. But this was the World Cup. Even though it was a campsite, I'd expected some sort of official Italian 90 arrangements. But there was no sign of anything. No information desk, no notices, no ticket details. In fact, there was sweet FA. Looks like I've been sold the duffer's tent. That's ever made. I can't put the pegs in. There were no more surprises that night. Scotland were beaten 1-0 by Costa Rica. But tomorrow was the big one. England v Ireland. And I still hadn't picked up my ticket yet. All right. Cheers. What happened? £10 to join membership and then £55 tickets. So what are you going to do? Um, Get them off the towel, actually. Yeah, get yeah. them off the towels. Where? Yeah, down the station. Where? Down the station. station. If you stand on that road up there, the promenade or whatever it is, they, they come, um, to you. come up and offer you tickets. Tangle up. One tangle up. Here, tangle up. Welcome to Italian 90. Before leaving England, I'd paid the compulsory tenor to join the England Travel Club. I'd also paid £55 each for the only tickets apparently available there. I shouldn't have bothered. The touts here were selling a batch of three £12 tickets for just 70 quid. While the English looked for touts and tickets, the Irish entertained the ever-present camera crews, me included, with old Celtic folk ditties. But it was the big boys in full kit. That's Union Jack T-shirt, number one crop, tattooed forearm, preferably with bulldog, that attracted very special attention. Thank you. Despite the high profile police presence, a match day drinks ban and the persistent media attention, people were doing their best to enjoy themselves and there were no problems getting to the ground. Cagliari had been preparing for this moment for about a year. They'd apparently spent thousands to accommodate the cars in the car park. But in the 40,000 capacity Santa Elia Stadium that night for England's opening World Cup match, 5,000 seats were empty. It looked like the Italian 90 administration was suspect from the start. We'd paid through the nose for expensive 55 quid tickets when there were cheaper, empty seats all around us. But FIFA had what it wanted. Millions were watching on TV. But I was there. Supporting England has never been easy, and the last eight years of Bobby Robson's rule has tested the loyalty of many English fans. Tonight's performance would test the patience of many more. England's opening goal, scrambled in by Lineker, lifted the crowd and lifted the contest from what could only loosely be described as international football. It had been an example of the English game at its worst. Negative, zonal, 4-4-2, misery. Anyway, 1-0, brilliant. At half-time, I asked the paying public how much more of this they'd be prepared to suffer. Well, here 
Yeah, for one. one game. We're going back on Wednesday. We're going back Wednesday. No. no we're just oh. for one game. Yeah. Yeah. We're going out here for one game. It's a freebie. Freebie, a, a oh, prize. Yeah, yeah. this company. Would you have come anyway? Oh, yeah. Delightful ball. <laughs> Set the World Cup. <laughs> one way or another, the Irish always looked capable of pulling one back. And even the weather became Celtic. With 20 minutes to go, Robson had a brainwave and decided to put McMahon on as substitute. And with only his third touch of the game, he managed to give the ball to Sheedy to produce the Irish equaliser. The old Wimbledon boot and hope method had prevailed, but at least it rewarded the wholehearted Irish commitment. I'd been apprehensive about filming in the stadium, but it had been a good start with the Irish, warm and friendly. This was Ireland's first trip to the World Cup finals, and they were just so glad to even be there. For them, it was a well-earned draw, but for England, it was a worrying start. The municipal campsite I'd found was 35 kilometres from the stadium. I'd managed to get back quickly to sleep off the memories of that turgid 90 minutes. But others weren't so lucky. There was no transport laid on to get them back from the stadium, and later I heard there'd been some trouble at the station. I started to take stock of what and who was around me. I wandered around the campsite with a camera, but was conscious of drawing attention to myself. It immediately distanced me from the people I was sharing the campsite with. Cabbage. I got the feeling that they were uneasy, and if they were uneasy, I was uneasy. I kept a lowish profile and decided to take things just as they happened. One person who made me more at ease, though, was Gino, the manager of the campsite. Please uh, ring back in five minutes, right? Thank you. Uh, can you go and uh, look for Jason, the tall uh, boy? Gino was a sort of tourismic good Samaritan. He didn't have to, but seemed willing enough to take on the welfare of his customers. Swollen glands. Um, swollen glands. Now, what can we do for that? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a doctor myself, but um, yes, Jason. Jason. Yes. Despite Gino's efforts, though, there was very little to do except knock a ball about, lie on the beach, or sit in the bar area. For me, that wasn't a problem. But for many, it was a case of being bored and stuck in the middle of nowhere. I started passing time with some lads from Wigan and Leeds. They were quite happy having me around and seemed to like the idea of what I was doing. The alcohol ban 24 hours either side of the match days had run out. I began to relax, and some of the blokes began to clown around with the camera. Just after this was recorded, though, a couple of South Londoners approached me and advised me to put my camera away in the bag, or, as they so politely put it, we'll kick you all around the bar. I think they meant it. Uh, <clears throat> having been threatened at a time where I thought I was getting on really well with lots of folks, and, and things were going really well, and I told them about the project, and, the job I was doing it and I was doing a sort of portrait of the World Cup and you know, as far as I was concerned that it was going to be from not only my point of view but also their point of view and um, going to get their views across. And um, I made some good friends and things were going well but two blokes threatened me anyway and that scared me, it really did scare me because I do understand that some of them don't trust um, any aspect of the press, and I understand that, because people are nicked and they are put away. Because, um, well, basically, I could be anybody. I could be an undercover copper. I could be um, tabloid press. I mean, I'm frightened being here every day. There's an underlying atmosphere that is really, really weird. Saturday the 16th of June found me pretty despondent. It was the big head-to-head -head England v Holland game. 
Initially, Callery seemed strangely subdued. The word had gone round that the English would march from the station directly to the stadium at six o'clock. I sensed trouble, and recent experience warned me that with a video camera on my shoulder, I wouldn't be made that welcome. So I chose not to seek out the scenes of mayhem and paranoia the press had been predicting and building up for so long. Instead, I found somewhere serving drinks and opted for a quiet, illicit beer in the Hotel Mediterraneo. A couple of Peronis later, an injured Carabinieri, blood streaming down his face, was whisked into the hotel. It was obvious it had all gone off. I ran outside and joined the people out on the street, but for the second time in two days, things got scary. I sought safety behind the cover of a hot dog van and watched while the Carabinieri and press moved in. They predicted trouble, and now they had it. It wasn't until I got back to London that I saw these pictures, and it seems to be a pretty fair account of what actually happened. Fans at the front of the march later claimed they'd been crushed up against police lines at a roadblock. Missiles were thrown and skirmishes broke out. The police chased the fans across waste ground and up side streets. For the first time in Cagliari, several rounds of tear gas were fired. Some of the people were injured. Many were in distress from tear gas inhalation. Eventually, the fans were forced onto a garage forecourt and things calmed down. As we entered the ground, we came up against the now familiar stringent security. We had coins, lighters and flagpoles confiscated. They wouldn't even allow plastic bottles into the stadium. But once inside, they were only too pleased to sell you a small bottle of Coke at £1.75 a time. Despite the riot, the stadium had a good atmosphere, and when the England team was announced, it was even better. After eight years on the job, the besieged Robson had masterfully picked England's second game of the World Cup finals to experiment with a long-awaited tactic. English football was about to experience a revolution, and patriotic feeling was running high. Robson had bewildered the press, the supporters, and possibly even the Dutch football team by playing Mark Wright as sweeper. <laughs> welcome 532, and welcome to truly international football. Gullit and Van Basten were barely allowed to exist. This time, the extortionate 55 quid ticket almost seemed worth it. I couldn't believe the difference. We saw the ball being stroked out of defence. Moves were actually being created. Butcher. A truly great international performer began to emerge. Paul Gascoigne was showing some nifty touches. A pretty good match ended nil-nil, and the Dutch were very lucky to get away with a draw. But as people made their way to the campsites, everybody knew that the main talking point of the evening wouldn't be the football. I don't think there's much that the media can do. If, if you've got the situation tonight, you know, with the trouble we had in Calgary, whereas I understand that you know, a, a group of fans you know, charge the police who are armed to the teeth. I mean, anybody that is that suicidal, um, cannot be stopped. There's nothing the media can do. There's nothing the authorities can do, actually. There's anything anybody can do about that sort of element. But I, 
you just hope when the Dutch fans tonight I thought were the were very good and they had a different sort of attitude towards uh, even at the game it wasn't the sort of the nasty chance of the English I mean that doesn't help you know the the insulting chance that they're chanting at the Dutch team I mean they were having a party of the Dutch and they even had a banner up you know that football so is peace English. So were the English having a party? They were having a party, yes, but I mean, even... Yeah, the, 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 the let's all have yeah. a disco thing. Yes, yeah, so that, that, was, that was much better, yeah. No, I walked they're still start, Italian yeah. singing that. But they're still starting shouting, you know, like shit, you know, when they're, they're announcing it. I just don't think it's necessary. I think they have to look at themselves too. I mean, they are trying to separate themselves, I know a lot of the fans, from that hooligan element. Um, but they don't always help themselves either with some of the... They also wear you know, very sort of aggressive T-shirts and things, you know, with... Bulldog Bobby and foaming pints in their hand. I, I don't think that helps the image. I think, I think that is part of the problem. You know, the, uh, and now it's become like, like the flag. Even the British flag is almost a, an international symbol of hooliganism. And they're wrapped in these flags on the front. People are on, on the Via Roma, which is a stylish part of Cagliari. And people are obviously going to be a, a little bit alarmed at that sort of sight. The morning after the riot, security had been tightened up around the site. We seemed to have been given our very own 24-hour armed guard. I relaxed, not because of the police presence, but I found out that the two drongos who'd threatened me had moved on. Life on the campsite seemed to be improving. Hey! No, 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 no! Hey! Come on! Huh? No! No? Well, sort of. Last night was a lot better. Last night was brilliant, I thought. Against the Dutch, we were the underdogs, and we did the business. We showed them we could still play football. Yeah, it was, I was chuffed last night. Yes. I was really chuffed. We're going back to this camp. I was, I was a bit debatable when they decided they are going to put a sweeping system in. So was I. I thought you'd... Because we've never done it for a long, run, long yeah. time, but it worked. I think they were proud to put the shirts on last night, of the other lads. Mm. If Robson had played the same system as, it ta as he played against the Irish, Van Basten would have had a field day with Rob, uh, with Butcher. It takes Butcher three three hours to turn round. I like this. Mm. I can see He's too stonky. He's too slow, but I do like him. Good professional. Good professional. Hope you're going to film this me drinking the beer. The old lady will think I'm really drunk again. I had no intention of telling his wife, but I had every intention of informing Bobby Robson that I'd found his natural successor. Well, I think it's just been the old school tie situation, hasn't it? The local side, Santa Margarita, made their pitch available to the campsite. The locals came to watch, bemused by Wigan, Leeds and Chelsea playing in the midday heat. There was no trouble on the terraces. As I filmed alone, it was relaxed and enjoyable. The tabloid boys wouldn't have been interested in this one. Fans and locals in World Cup good time kickabout. It doesn't sell newspapers, does it? But what went on afterwards later that night, the comic brigade would have seen as something to really get their teeth into. About half an hour ago, got back here via another campsite about half a mile up the road. And there was a lot of activity. And I saw tons and tons of troops who apparently had surrounded about 30 people um, at gunpoint. And people were completely freaked out. Um, a very weird atmosphere. Came back here to find that a police bus had come here with Calvinari with guns. Um, Coming through the gate and everyone here who, well, people are fairly drunk here. The majority are fairly drunk. But um, what had happened was bottles were being thrown at the Calvinari. Um, and they, they left, and things have sort of calmed down now, but it's just gone absolutely bonkers. But um, out of the people who got involved in that, 
I mean, it was just, you know, basically about five of these guys here. There's about sort of 30 still up. And, you know, about five of them, literally five or six people, um, are psychos there and were prepared. We were in a campsite in the middle of nowhere. There were five guys there who were prepared to take on um, paramilitary with guns. And they're completely mad. They're totally mad. But we've got a good bloke who's in charge of the campsite here who um, has telephoned the cabinary and calmed the situation down by you know, telling them that it's the best thing to do is just you know, not come anywhere near here because these guys, even though there's you know, just a few psychos who are prepared to go for it, there's other guys here who are really drunk and um, out of their heads, completely out of their heads, um, who would do something absolutely ridiculous. And if this carries on around here, there's just going to be big, big trouble. And it's, it's madness. Eki Antoni, me tämä on mankun niin rispoti. Puhuin treenalta ei noja. Si si, bengi tapei. Kedo se skasson ta. In kamin. In my camp, nothing happened. There was some trouble. I heard in another campsite not far from here. And uh, what happened was they were looking for a troublemaker. From the news I got, they caught the troublemaker, and it seems that uh, uh, Carabinieri uh, car was uh, the windows were broken. After the police had gone and that, because there was some trouble down the road, a few of the English lads a bit drunk and that singing. Basically, the police turned up in right gear. Rather overreacted, steamed in there with all their right gear. And before that, as far as I could tell, before they had a chance to do anything, they was attacked by the English bottles and that. And the police legged it. There was just no reason for it, like, because it was all sat over there, like, singing. <clears throat> and that, they all came charging, all with shields and that. Did they? Yeah, uh, all came... Anyone away? No, like, but they was all stood, like, you know, just, like, on steps over there. And like everyone was like just going, you know, there's like egging us on that really. And, like somebody threw a bottle at him and that. And everyone started walking towards them and pushed them back like. And we were like all that like, quieting down and they go on that like, the bus. And as it was going, some a couple of windows at the bus got put through. There was someone uh, selling uh, strange cigarettes. Let's call them strange cigarettes. Yeah. I don't know what you call them. Smoking yeah, smoking dope. Yeah. All right, but yeah. I don't know if it's true or not, but yeah. this is what I heard. So the Carabinieri, I would say efficiently, yeah. you know, got old immediately yeah. of the two lads yeah. that they were trying to raise trouble. Yeah. Like, I don't know, some lads like, were tripping and that. And they were what? Some lads were tripping, like, you know. Yeah. And I said, no, like. What acid? Yeah. yeah. Like, they were just all like, just, it just got blown out of proportion, really. And everyone was like shouting and that. Same. There was nothing, there was no Gina, trouble. Gina's a bit upset. Yeah, because like, everyone was shouting and somebody like told him, F off, like he reckons. But I don't think anybody did. None, none of the lads who's been here out of town would have done that anyway. Because right. been, he's been okay with us, like, you know. Right. I had my flag on my tent here. And I, I was that ashamed of what was happening. I, was that ashamed of what, what was happening? I took me flag down, I was ashamed to call myself English. I couldn't believe what was going on. A number of fans had already left, fed up with what was happening in the campsite at night. With armed guards outside the gate, it was getting dangerous. No one involved in football, Italia 90 or the FA, had been near the campsite. Gino had all the problems. Uh, I mean, it should have been my duty. I have to say, it should be my duty to make everybody respect the regulations of this campsite. And from now onwards, that is what will be done. At midnight, everybody has to be in bed asleep. Otherwise, I personally have to call the Carabinieri and get this campsite cleared.
12 o'clock curfew tonight. It's half past 12. The guys are still up. Coach load of cabin area just arrived. I'm going to go up in a little aeroplane tomorrow. I saw a little, you know, one of those um, micro-light aeroplanes flying over the other day. And I asked if I could, um, if I could hire it for half an hour. It's, it's very cheap. So I'm going to go up, up in that tomorrow with my camera. And I'm going to have a look at the England camp all the posh hotels and villa complexes along this coast and the campsites. And uh, I'm going to have a look at a place called Forte Village. It should be fun. Ow. Ow. Via! I had the idea that with a trip up in this terrifying flying moped, I'd be able to make some sense of what was going on. Here I am on one of the most beautiful islands in the world, but I'm living on a campsite where some of the guys are the most blatantly narrow-minded xenophobic thugs I've ever had the displeasure of meeting. And yet, just two miles down the road, is the Forte Village. Comfortably billeted in the lap of expense-accounted luxury are the gentlemen of the press, many of whom are here to report the hooliganism they obviously anticipate. Both worlds live off each other, but the worst this world suffers is a bar running out of ice, the late arrival of a hire car, or, God forbid, all the tennis courts being booked. Meanwhile, Back at campsite Hooligano in Glazy, it's a three-mile walk to a bus that probably won't stop, it's inflated rip-off ticket prices to a stadium that's half empty, and it's terminal boredom with DIY facilities. And instead of a helping hand from blue-suited Italia 90 hostesses, there's a coachload of disorganised and heavily armed carabinieri waiting to kick your head in. I've decided to leave the campsite down the road because the pilot I met this morning, Fabrizio, um, who took me up, just you know, going up and down the coast, said that I could um, pitch the tent here and I had lunch here. And um, I decided to come here and have two days of peace and quiet, uh, which I think I've deserved, actually. OK? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Martina. Martina. And that's Sophie Loren behind the camera there. Non mi vedi. Non mi vedi. Non mi vedi. Non mi vedi. Non c'è Sophie Loren. I hadn't really missed rural Britannia at four in the morning, and I slept well that night. But on waking, I wasn't immediately certain that moving from the campsite just up the road to Fabrizio's farm had been such a good idea. It wasn't exactly the cosy domestic harmony I'd expected, but I assumed in 15 years' time, these kids will have grown out of this sort of behavior. National pride Italiano style. It wasn't a case of if the Italians could get there, but who they'd meet in the final. I stayed in the peace and quiet of Fabrizio's family with seven brothers, two sisters, minor bird, two dogs and assorted bambinos for three days. They fed me huge amounts of pizza and chicken. Constantly they questioned me about the campsite. Why Uliganos? Uliganos only come from London? Do you have tattoos? 
Only young boys are Uliganos. In the press, on the radio, on television, they'd heard about Echo Uligano Inglesi for months and months. We've been here for about two weeks now, and we've heard constantly on the local press and on the English press that they're constantly branding us as yobos and hooligans, where the vast majority are just normal supporters. I made the most of my time away from the campsite and started becoming a proper little investigative journo. I wanted to try and pin down the international dimension of what was going on here. I made an appointment to meet up with a sports journalist I'd run into after the Holland match. The management of Forte Village had been told not to let me in. Luckily, the journalist, Tony Quested, was happy to talk to me in the car park outside the barrier of what the hacks called Fort Apache. I think the FA is under pressure. Uh, because of what happened in the European Championships two years ago. A lot of that violence that was caused there was caused by German and Dutch fans and not by the English. But because hooliganism is called uh, an English disease, everything that happens gets stuck on English fans. But certainly from the government's point of view... What, do you think they did they, the best of a bad job? I think, yeah, I think the government is, is turning around and saying, we, do, we don't want you back in Europe unless the fans behave. It's an impossible burden to place on anyone because you're always going to get a few loonies spoiling it. What I'm saying is that the fans of Holland, the fans of Germany, fans I've seen from Poland, in Poland and other countries are probably far worse than, than the English hooligans. So there's only one reason, there's only one reason we're being kept out of Europe and that is because it is politically wise for countries like Spain and Italy who want to get all the money from European competitions and all the success which they were uh, starved of when English clubs were in there winning everything. They were clapping their hands when English clubs were banned from Europe and they will put pressure on FIFA to keep England out. And all the government is doing is making it easier for them to do so. Tony Crested had a pretty good idea of what was going on. And don't think too many of the fans didn't either. They were extras on trial in a globally orchestrated farce. Happy and glorious My next assignment was to cover a football match, Italy versus England. The game had been put together by Fabrizio and his brothers against the campsite Select 11. I was on neither team sheet, but surprise, surprise, I was the only camera there. And I was more than happy to film from the bench. <laughs> it is the World Cup final. The Italians showed some nice touches and a keen and competitive friendly, unfortunately coming up against a resolute English defence. The English keeper seeming to mistake Fabrizio's eye here for the ball put Fabrizio out of the game needing three stitches, enabling a late substitution. <laughs> I came on for the last 10 minutes. Having once had a trial for Swansea schoolboys, I combined the commitment of Gascoigne, the heart of Butcher, the speed and vision of Roberto Baggio, and the timing of a Welsh pit pony. <laughs> Moving well off the ball, creating good space for myself outside the box, I was starved of the service my goal-scoring hunger so desperately craved. Three all and a good advert for football, Brian. I'd almost forgotten we had to qualify for the second phase on the mainland, and I'd almost forgotten what it was like to be in the company of women. Franca, Fulvio, Patrizio, Roberto and Fabrizio joined me for a leisurely trip into Cagliari to watch the Egypt match. Hello. The Egyptian Navy had given hundreds of sailors and their ship time off to swan around the Med 
sailing between Sicily and Sardinia to watch their first phase matches. Win or lose, these guys were going to have a party. But for Bobby Robson, this was not going to be a party. And there was no question of losing. Although replacing Butcher and Stevens with Parker and Wright, a good move, I thought, he chose not to run at the Egyptians, drop the sweeper, and batten down the hatches. <laughs> With 20 minutes left, Wright did manage to nod one in and point us towards Bologna. It seemed to have little discernible effect on the shore leave party, and they enjoyed themselves defiantly. We were top of the group, and everyone's happy. Yeah, brilliant, superb. Yeah. Crap game, right, but I feel dead chuffed. As long as we get through, that's it. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. Mate, yeah. How do you feel? Great. The performance ain't that clever, but the thing is we're here, aren't we, mate? See you in Rimini and Bologna, mate. All, right. All the best. Look like yourself. Turn off. When we win the World Cup, girls, England are the greatest football team. We're on the march with Bobby's army. We're all going to it too. And we're really shaking up when we win the World Cup, girls, England are the greatest football team. If we can respond to that, gentlemen, the purpose of gathering here this morning is to make a presentation to Gino of, out of money that was very generously donated by all you young men here. And I think that with a few hours only to <coughs> remaining of our stay in Sardinia, many of you will be leaving with a feeling that as far as the authorities are concerned, the young English supporters were not only uncared for and uncatered for, but largely unwanted as well. I think it's been very, very poor. <coughs> but whatever memories we have of Sardinia, I'm sure we should leave with very warm and affectionate memories of Gino, who has done so much to make life a lot easier for us. And it's fun. And I'd like to call on young Victor to make the presentations to Gino. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank you all for having come these two weeks, and I hope when now you go to the mainland, you feel uh, well as you have felt here in our camp. Because I know these past few days, there have been something that didn't really go well, but I wish you could forget the bad things and always remember the good ones and think that Sardinians, especially Sardinians, you know, are really nice people. No, forget the bad ones. There, are, there is good and bad in every, in every country, everywhere in the world. But if we are all friends and brothers and we love each other, I'm sure that we get on very well in life for a very, very long time. That's my message to each and every one of you. Thank you. Hey. 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 Well, we're off right now. <laughs> we're off the back fence because there's no money for the day like. And, uh... <laughs> right, we're going back to Manchester. We've got tickets for the second phase, yeah. but we're going to sell them tonight. Oh, yeah? because of the organization is half as bad as this. 
We don't want to know. The Italians on Sardinia have been quite nice to normal people, but the Carabinieri have been spoiling for it. They're looking for it. And we're expecting much the same thing on the mainland. We've had a but great time with, if it, the, with the Italians. If the Italians yeah. on the mainland believe what, what the, um, they've been told, then it might be a little bit hairy. I knew how good Gino's been to the people. I'm, it's been like hooligans been staying here, but the people try to help us. And as I say, I've, I've run out of money, I had no money. And I come to Gino and now he's given me a ticket mm. to get home. I'm going round his house for dinner now. First Italian meal. England's got to be changed before the people change in England. But the people, the English that have come out here, the Sardinian people have made them change because their way, because how they are. It's, it's the place, the people. Yeah. I think if you come in without football, yeah. it's the place to come, Sardinia. It's because England, like, we've all got this thing to be hard and tough, but in, in these countries, That's people just don't want to know about it. Like, and no. I'll just blame, like, you know, I'm not political, but I'll just blame the government for what they're doing. I've, to the people, I'm not saying the people in England, like, uh, you know, they've got it very hard in England to people in these countries. We ain't got this scenery, we've got dirty sea water, everything's dirty about England. And yet, like, the people are just normal people in Sardinia, and that's what I think's done it. Sono due, quattro e uno cinque. Grazie e buona giornata. Arrivederci. Yes, uh, Mr. Hallan, everybody has gone away and uh, most of them uh, had uh, a very good behavior mm -hmm. while uh, they stayed at our camp. Mm -hmm. But I have to report something that has not made me very happy at all. Some of them have gone away without paying the bill. Without paying the bill? Yes, there are about <coughs> 70 persons of whom I have uh, the uh, number of passports mm -hmm. and dates of birth and everything. And I'm trying to sort these things out now uh, with uh, uh, the British government, British uh, consulate here in Cagliari. It's difficult because they're all young people, they're all uh, football fans. They have a, a special behavior when they are all together because if you talk to them uh, separately, one by one, I think they're excellent. But when they are all together, they are bound to behave in a, in a strange way that I do not really understand yet. I haven't made my mind up yet why they behave that way, you know. Uh, at moments, being at home myself, I feared, I have to say that yeah. I feared so for my I. own life. So did I. And also what I have to say is that uh, there is a little bit of exaggeration in drinking. Mm -hmm. Young men of 18, 19, 20, being real drunk. I'm 45 years old myself and I never had myself such, such amount of drink. Yeah. In, in one day, I never seen anybody no. drinking so much. Yeah. Well, I'm it's, sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. You know, yeah. if this program will be yeah. seen, mm -hmm. and the, and the boys that have been here mm -hmm. now, they they may criticize me afterwards and say, "Well, that's not the real Gino we have known." No, no. I'm lot, saying this for their own sake. Yeah. For their own sake, they're young. Yeah. They have to change. They yeah. have to change because that's not the attitude they have. They have to take in life. Well, I, I've been, I was here for nine days, and I'd like to thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure, uh, Mr. Haran, to have <laughs> you here with us, and uh, I hope you can come back again. Well, I did pay my bill, and what's more, I was picking up this journo business fast. I figured that if half the world's press and the remaining supporters had struck camp for the mainland, that basically left me, the camera, and the England squad on the island. There was someone I wanted to talk to. I've just been to training to watch the lads train down the road at Pula. And um, somehow got in to watch him train. There's there very little security because most people have left the island now. And the England team who are staying here at the Ismola's Golf Hotel will leave tomorrow morning. 
So I managed to get a chat with Bobby Robson and told him the nature of um, what I'm doing here, that it's a football fan's um, diary of the World Cup, which he um, didn't seem to believe, but eventually agreed to meet me here at 10 to 1 outside the hotel. The team just uh, arrived here from training. And it's now 5 to 1, so we'll see if he turns up or not. <laughs> I don't think he will, but you never know. After waiting for an hour, I was told, as long as I stuck to the subject of football, that I might have five minutes in the company of the England Supremo. Although a certain amount of blag had got me this far, I was taken by surprise. I was unprepared. I'd forgotten my tripod, and so with the camera perched on right shoulder, I sat opposite Robson and froze in the midday heat, groping for a question, any question. How are things going? Get out of that one, Bobby. Well, you're playing fine. Um, <clears throat> you can see the facilities we've got here. So we've been here yeah. for three weeks and they've been very pleasant. And um, absolutely ideal. We've got on with the matches. We've just got through the first phase. All the matches were fairly different, all right. difficult. Was um, the, the Egypt game was a completely different game? Was it? Did, did you see the spoilers? No, Sorry, negative. no, not quite. No. no. Uh, the, the, the one physical... I didn't really have the experience to contain all I wanted to put to him in the last three and a half minutes. I wanted an in-depth discussion of the Robson news. I wanted to argue about tactics and team selection. But I genuinely felt sorry for this bloke and what his professional and personal life had suffered at the hands of the so-called voice of British sport, the gutter press. I settled for small talk. Uh, but they also played some football as well. How the players relax? Well, uh, in various ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've, we've allowed them to sunbathe because they were here for, th you know, three and a half, four weeks, and, and uh, you just can't keep them indoors all that time. And as long as they do things gradually, you know, a bit of suntan doesn't do them any harm. Mm -hmm. Do you think we've got the easiest route to the final? <laughs> <laughs> there are no easy realize, routes in the world. I didn't realize there were so easy routes in World Cup football. <laughs> you know, it, it looks, it looks uh, nice in that way, but, you yeah. know, who knows? Who can tell? My revealing five minutes with Bobby Robson had come to an end. We exchanged cliches and went our separate ways. I had time for just one final feed back at the farm, accompanied by a sing-song of new English classics. La, la. Ooh, la, la. <laughs> Fabrizio predicted England-Italy in the final. I thanked the family for their outstanding hospitality and said my fond goodbyes. Finale England-Italia. Okay. Ciao. As I pulled away from Sardinia, the Robbie Bobson interview was still bugging me. Why hadn't I put to him the one question I really wanted an answer to? Bobby, why did you ruin Glenn Hoddle's international career? I'd taken time out away from the campsite in Sardinia. I'd lost contact with Leeds, Chelsea, Jersey, Wigan and co and there wasn't a Union Jack in sight. I was late and a bit out of touch. Although the Belgian match was being played in Bologna tomorrow night, word had gone round the campsite over a week ago that Rimini was where the main bulk of English supporters were going to be billeted. I had a 15-hour cruise and a long drive to Bologna ahead of me, but this time I was lucky enough to get a cabin, which I shared with three Sardinians.
that if you go to Bologna, this is true, you get a really good blowjob. <laughs> if all the Bolognian girls <laughs> give good Pampolino. <laughs> As I slept and pleasantly dreamt of sweeper systems and Bolognian girls in nappies, there were nightmares on the Adriatic that night. The so-called Battle of Rimini had raged into the early hours of the morning. and uh, retaliation by the police, which uh, led to quite severe violence and the use of tear gas for only the third time since the World Cup Finals began. And who started it? Not completely clear, but the impression is that about 60 England fans who were drinking in a pub, um, ironically known as the, the Rose and Crown, by the waterfront in Rimini. The Battle of Rimini was about as surprising as Beckenbauer's German machine reaching the second phase. The chances of English clubs getting back into Europe now were being whittled away. I don't condone the violence, but the way people were being treated on Sardinia, it didn't come as any surprise to me that the cork had popped. was full of performing Belgians. The culinary capital of Italy seemed to have been taken over by them. There was a strange absence of English supporters and I wanted to know what had happened last night. So I nipped over to Bologna's grandest hotel, the Baglioni, to find out how the press boys were reacting. There were battles in Rimini last night, serious battles. And you know, as long as that keeps happening, the sport is going to be herded, they're going to be treated badly, there's going to be stories written about them. I think a lot of um, their problems have built up over the years. I've followed England now since the 60s, missed very few games. I've seen this hooligan problem grow. 
And although it's improved hugely in our own country, we've sorted it out, we have very little trouble in the grounds, there is still a certain element, very few, but it only needs very few, 40 or 50 of them, who seem to be on all these trips, seem to be well funded, and seem to be intent on causing trouble. Who's to blame for that? Well, the sports minister's arriving any minute, you should ask him. Do you think he's got a lot to answer for? I think you don't have to I think the government that. have. Yeah, I'll answer it. I'll answer it publicly. I think the government have an awful lot to answer for because they refuse to accept any responsibility that football was part of their problem. They refuse to accept it as part of the law and order ticket on which they got elected. And, and they have now accepted it, but too late. As Bob Harris's fellow journalist, Tony Quested, had suggested on Sardinia, this was developing into an international game of saving England's face abroad. And the stakes were high. As one little Englishman arrived in Italy, many more big ones were being flown out. There were rumours going around Bologna that a significant number of deportees had been innocent bystanders. It was also rumoured that the plane had been chartered three days before. Whatever, about 246 seats were occupied by a seemingly convenient complement of 246 people. At the stadium that night, there were a lot of people looking around to see if anyone they knew had taken an early bath. Post-riot security had reached alarming proportions. Over 2,000 carabinieri had been drafted in for the match. <laughs> On the field, it was a promising lineup. The sweeper system had been reinstated, and apart from McMahon, it was the same side that played the Dutch. Belgium were never, ever going to be any kind of pushover. They were an intelligent side with bags of experience and talented World Cup players such as Kuhlemans and Schiefer. I'd put it to Robson on Sardinia with stunning accuracy that the Belgians were going to be a tough nut to crack. And indeed they were. With Belgium hitting the woodwork twice, it was a tense affair. Before the half-time stripper had a chance to show what he was made of, it was back to a tight contest. Belgium picked up the second half where they had left off and were getting well on top. Gascoigne pulled us back into the game, working like a Trojan, always creating and again showing some lovely touches. Bull had gone on for a groin strain Barnes and with 20 minutes remaining, Platt replaced McMahon. And as nakedness crept into a relentless battle, this was getting tougher and tougher. An overworked Gascoigne managed to get himself booked before the end of the 90 minutes, but it remained nil-nil. With another 30 minutes to endure, I feared the worst. To be honest, this ding-donger could have gone either way. But in the very last minute, with a penalty shootout looming, Gascoigne floated the perfect ball over the Belgian wall, where David Platt became Roy of the Rovers. We were in the World Cup quarter-finals.
After the game, I headed into nearby Rimini. The last-minute victory over Belgium was trying hard to erase the bitterness and confusion of the violence and deportation. It was becoming obvious that there was much more to this than met the eye, and the more I heard, the more ridiculous it all seemed. <laughs> and there was loads of Italian police outside. They came up to us and said to me, me and him could pass as Italians. He said, are you Italian? Get back there. He said, no, we're English. They said, are you English? Step this way. And they walked us down to here. And there were six of us. And we walked down here and they put us into a van and took us to the, the, the station. Now, of the six people they put in, Two people were on an 1830s holiday, and two people were South Africans. And the two people we were with, they were on an 1830s holiday. We've got all their luggage there. We, we got to the police station and climbed over a barbed wire fence, and we're still here. Otherwise, we would now be back home. Should be hung, Moyne. I agree. Hung, definitely. I wish you would come to this bar now and tell us people who you are. You wouldn't walk out of here alive. You're a, you a traitor, Moyne. There's not many men of violence here, but we'd like to talk to you. That's all we can say because you, you've been a tra you should be hung for treason, if nothing else. Lord, you know, do you know what Moyne had is known as by England supporters? Lord Ho Ho. He was a traitor as well, wasn't he? Lord Ho-Ho, you've left us in the lurch. We've been we've been spat on, and you've left us. Lord Ho-Ho, oh, oh, oh. and you're the man. William Joyce, you meant to protect, oh, oh. protect our interests, and you've done nothing but make them worse. <laughs> I have no way of explaining this. I was tired and pissed. Riots, deportations, Carabinieri, England in the quarterfinals. After three pints of Malibu and blackcurrant, it seemed somehow essential that I compose a late night ode to the Wolverhampton Wanderers centre forward, Steve Bull. What's that, a final ticket? <laughs> To be a football fan in Rimini, then, was the ultimate in paranoia. But no one here gave a toss. We'd been abandoned in Sardinia, betrayed by Bologna. The thugs had handed the authorities and the tabloid press English football on a plate. By Rimini, innocence was immaterial. The plane home had been filled and the example had been set. I took refuge and lunch in the company of the Minetti family. I'm saying is that the British, the British football clubs, the FA and people like that, should discriminate before they come abroad. They should get into a position not where, like the Irish and the Scottish, people come aboard, families or whatever they are, they, they, they bring their customs with them. It's not that the Scottish left their, their you know, rituals at home, they had their kilts on, they had the old hats with the two feathers in yeah, them, really the tartan, they, really they got pissed up, they did everything they wanted to, they did it within a context. What I'm saying is that the 30 odd guys who maybe were the provokers in the Rose and Crown, right? shouldn't have got here in the first place. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's true. They shouldn't be here in the first place, because to me, the owner of the Rosencrantz, as far as I'm concerned, they were ready, already. They knew what they wanted to do. May I introduce you to the Rosencrown, this charming, oldie-worldie English taverna, this innocent location of the Battle of Rimini. There I took afternoon tea in the company of Damien and Simon, two South End blokes I'd recognised from Gino's campsite. For years now, Brits have been coming here from all over Blighty, from West Ham to Plymouth Argyle, 
They've packed them in and beard them up. It's as subtle as the okie-cokie. There I found the manager, the man who'd sold the drinks that night, claiming the violence was set up. Nothing to do with him, of course. Obviously the boys, they were saying that uh, they were here uh, just drinking and uh, they didn't start anything. Uh, I declare that uh, I still think now that everything was more or less planned and organized. Uh, obviously out of, uh, we had about three, four hundred people in this place. Obviously they were not all aware of what, what would have happened, but it's a minority, they knew everything. And um, I'm quite convinced about it because uh, everything started at the same time on both ends. He reckons they were already planned, ready for it. He said, because during the afternoon, they weren't being as good as all. They weren't giving any hassle at all. You know, they were right, you know, sharp. They weren't giving any hassle. They started they, at the right they moment. They had a lot to drink. Afterwards, they I... Had a lot yeah, they had a lot to drink. Yeah, but the listen, Rimini was the only place as well that didn't have the 48-hour ban. Yeah, right. They said at Rimini, said in some we're going to treat them. He said to them, no, Georgina, well. he no, said, no, no sorry, one minute, one minute. He tried to be, he tried to be, what do you he call them? He tried to be a bit cleverer than anybody else. He thought, no, I'll make a few bob clever. tonight. No. Be the only one who's going to sell them no, some No, Georgina, booze. one minute. No. He said, he said it, they all said it. No, Georgina, that's true. And he said, I reckon they won't give us any trouble. We've been dealing with them for 25 years. I think it would have been a lot better for the atmosphere if there were uh, a lot more uh, girls with them. That would have made a big difference. Carry on talking about that. Because, you know, when you get hundreds of, uh, of boys or, and, uh, on their own, or obviously what they do to enjoy themselves, they only drink, drink and drink, nothing else to do. Maybe with, with girls and women, Probably they would have uh, tried other other things, uh, pubs, uh, discotheques, and some other things, you know. Yeah. Who's that? <laughs> I left the flesh pots of Rimini disillusioned but undeterred. Basically, we are all travelling with the same label now, made in England, handled with care. I think the Carabinieri have their own interpretation of that phrase. Naples was next, there was a quarter-final to be played, Cameroon were waiting, and nothing was going to stop me. I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know what's wrong with it, but... I've got to get to Naples by tomorrow to get my ticket for the quarter-final. It'd be quite good if they could just ship the car back to England on the back of an AA truck. And I could accidentally leave the camera in the car so that gets shipped back as well. I could maybe hire a moped or a scooter and do the rest like that. It'd be much better because that camera I haven't mentioned this before, but in case you've forgotten, the camera, which had usually been strapped to a seat, had been my only constant companion, and it hadn't been a great relationship. If I could have found a comfortable way of strapping it to my forehead, I would have done. The car couldn't be fixed straight away, and I was in a hurry to get my quarter-final ticket. My AA breakdown vouchers allowed me to hire a Fiat Uno, made by robots and driven by idiots. Pretty nifty, though. I loved it. I stopped off to each just outside Naples and caught the end of Italy nudging Ireland out of the tournament 1-0. It might have been the end of an incredible World Cup run, but I bet that night the Irish were painting Rome green. It was getting late to find accommodation. Instead of heading into the centre of Naples, 
The carabinieri in the restaurant directed me to a campsite. I must admit, I didn't fancy it. I needn't have worried, though. I met old faces from Sardinia, and it was no problem. I was allowed to join the club. Above all, they now thought that what I was doing here was OK. No, you've got to leave my pork. It's got to be cooked slowly. Is that pork? Yeah, you've yeah, got, got a nice oh, spoon well, it. Then you've got no pork Let the flames go down. I was back in the bosom. Bastards, you assholes! 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 Tell me what's been happening since Sardinia. Pardon? Tell me what's been happening since Sardinia. Not a great deal, still the same, isn't it? What? Same amount of boredom when there ain't no football on. Spending enough money again. Well, if, if she ain't there, I'll say. I'll ring them up, I've got the phone on. You've got a batch of blonde, haven't you, though? Know? <laughs> 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 fucking loads of van. Fuck, yeah. the, fuck the van. I knew I wasn't with a bunch of girl guides, but this time it didn't bother me. I figured that should the occasion arise, these guys were well able to take care of themselves. But I didn't seriously think that they had any intention of orchestrating violence. Yeah, well, what have we got? Two got three drivers here. Go out tomorrow morning, and if they start off a couple of hours before us, we'll catch them up on the old strider. We'll get a couple of people down, mate. But then we'll say this, we've got to fucking win first. You've got to what? Get a couple, innit? What do you mean we've got to Give them a short job. Give them all out by the time we got to Nice. What sort of budget did you set out? There was still a drinks ban either side of match days. So on the afternoon of the quarter-final, we wandered out of the campsite and, would you believe, found a British forces base just up the road. Her Majesty's services were not only serving cold beer, but selling it at subsidised prices. Maybe our luck was turning. We had a couple of beers, saluted our hosts, and boarded our awaiting hoolie buses. Our convoy, with its very own police escort, had been laid on to get us the 15 miles to the stadium. Singing and sweating, Bobby's army squeezed its way through the Neapolitan suburbs. I'd barely heard a good word spoken about Bobby Robson in the last three weeks, and yet everyone seemed willing to join his army, me included. By the time we reached the San Paolo Stadium, it was clear that Uligano Inglesi had reached cult status. The circus had come to town. It was actually the first time the fans had had coordinated services laid on for them, but for all the wrong reasons. The Huli buses were providing a service of containment. No one wanted the so-called animals escaping their cages. But in Naples, our hosts turned out in numbers to see the show and the performers gave a worthy performance. By beating Argentina three weeks ago, Cameroon had become the revelation of the tournament. But with four players out through bookings and injuries, 
I don't think anyone really thought they'd pose much of a problem. But they posed, as it turned out, a very big problem. They began to string their passes together. In one way or another, the England midfield was finding it very difficult to break through. England were getting absolutely nowhere. But after 25 minutes, Pierce floated a ball to the waiting head of Platt, and thank God, it was 1-0. By the second half, it was a lead we were lucky to hold on to. Gascoigne had brought down super sub Roger Miller for a penalty that made it one all. Before England even had time to realise what these underdogs were doing to them, Miller's through ball had put a Keke through to stroke it in, putting them 2-1 up. And they deserved it. England, sweeper system and all, were now being played off the park, but we somehow bounced back. With 10 minutes to go, the Cameroons let England off the hook. Lineker was crashed over for a penalty. He sent Nkono the wrong way. All. This supposed walkover had developed into a very serious game of football. Ekeke. 22 players began to wilt in the heat, and as the inevitable penalty shootout loomed, a very knackered Gascon momentarily perked up, threaded a ball of pinpoint accuracy through to Lineker who is in turn sandwiched between Nkono and a clumsy defender. Another penalty. Ice cool Lineker again made no mistake. It was 3 2, but with 15 minutes to go, the final whistle seemed hours in coming. Stop, Turin.
as the rest of the stadium quickly emptied, we sang and stayed behind for the customary one-hour lock-in. We didn't really need entertaining, but a constipated carabinieri guard dog provided brief relief before we were herded back onto the awaiting hooli buses. Before setting off for the long drive to Turin, a Eurosport crew we had bumped into on Sardinia came to do an early morning Hooli Watch item. Kevin, I thought you'd been deported. <laughs> they knew what I'd been doing in Italy, and they knew that I'd been heavily warned by the BBC Sports boys to stay well out of what they seemed to regard as their World Cup. All the BBC boys here, they were celebrating, you know. They said, Kevin's going, I bet. I bet. Thank you. They're giving me jip. <laughs> well, he's not, he's not a sportsman. Or something, you know. They think he just gets in the way. OK. Who talking? Now, the, the, the mayor of Rimini has been saying that she wants the, um, the, the match moved to a different venue because of the possibility of trouble. Do you have any worries Mayor of Turin, about that you mean? Of, Turin, yeah. Turin. I mean, are, are you worried by that, the possibility of trouble because of Heisel? Everyone worries for their own safety, don't they? And, like, if it is true what they're saying, it's more than just, like, you know, a bit of a hooligan punch-up, isn't it, if people want revenge for what happened six years ago. But, I mean, all over these f uh, four weeks, it looks like people have wanted revenge. Not that serious, you know what I mean? But you'll, you'll be going up there anyway? I'll be going there, yeah. I'm going to uh, like, drop a team who's got to the semi-final. First time in, say, 20-odd years, you know. Or second time ever. I'll be going there, yeah. We'll all be going there together, won't we, boys? That's What's the media coverage been like in <coughs> the home? A few more questions, right? It's been, I reckon it's just been pretty good. I don't know, it's a, you know, you've got the difference between press and TV, mm. really. Mm. I mean, the, the mirror has been sort of bullshitting on the football front. Right. The sun talks shit all the time. Yeah. But the TV coverage has been pretty strange. Well, you were the ones who got these pictures in Rimini, right, now. What yes. really happened? Did you actually show them? Right? Yes. Yeah. And half of them people was in bed that night, all the trouble. Yeah. Right, let's get a few people leaving. Damien and Simon had been more than happy to play the role allocated to them. The crew had got what they wanted, and it was agreed by all that Turin was going to be no picnic. I hit the road and stopped off for more videotapes which were waiting for me at Rome Airport. I drove through the night, arriving at Turin without a ticket. Know the ticket offices. <laughs> I was directed to yet another municipal campsite, where a small queue was waiting for an official allocation of just 1,500 tickets to be sold from one small barred window. <laughs> Welcome once again to Italia 90. Thank you, please. I understand that some of you could not hear this broadcast. I will repeat. We have now received. One, approximately 1,000 tickets at Category 3. Normally these tickets are £33. We have paid £65 each for them, but we will sell to our members at the face value of £33. We await further information on other tickets, but we are told we are not likely to receive this information until late tonight or early tomorrow morning. But we are, this is for members only, and we hope that you will bear with us for a bit longer. Thank you. So you don't need a badge? Are you from the FA? 
No, the thousand, the three, the thousand for the card for the for the category three. Okay. okay. Right, right, right. So that's in I can't answer that. You have to. The Italians don't tell us that. We can't. I can't answer it. Yes, I can't answer that. When can you join him, mate? Eh? No, he can't. Can't now. Can't. Do it tomorrow. Yeah. He said if he gets more tickets, he'll let people join. It's like a fucking concentration camp, isn't it? Yeah, what annoys me is like there's, there's been people Can't even fucking leave up and shit. That's right. Understandably, Imagine they're really the uptight. The they can't yeah. even sort of allocate the tickets properly. So they take away the people who've got the vouchers to allocate them somewhere else to get the queue down so that everybody knows where they stand. And they can't even do that. I mean, the organisation is just out of order. I thought it would be a really good thing to go and see the semi-final of the World Cup. Wonderful, you know, go out there and see what it's all about. I mean, seeing all the excitement on the television. But when you really get in the thick of it, it's quite a different thing altogether, you know. I mean, I've just spent a total of six hours in the crush there, you know. You've got a ticket? Yeah, I've got one in the end. How much do you pay? Um, 33. Because I got one of the, um, before I came out, I was able to get a voucher, you know. So I was quite lucky. But you see, I mean, I'm in the middle of the crush there. I mean, they're all like him, you see. They haven't got vouchers. And I pull out mine, but there's no animosity. They don't say, oh, no, you know. They immediately you, pass my voucher to the front in front of them and get, get a ticket, so it's, you know. The very good spirit among everybody. But you see, what happens, the media come here and slack them all off. They're all made out to be animals. All this is whipped up by the government, you know, I mean, and by the media. Oh, yeah, the Minister of Sport, you know, who comes along and starts saying, oh, they're all rubbish, and... Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I've just spent six hours jammed in among them, you know, and, I mean, there's... there's um, of course they start getting annoyed when they hear there's only a thousand seats, because where are the rest if they only give the Germans a thousand? The rest must be going to Italians, you know, Pam. Do you know how many tickets the Germans have got? How many have the Germans got? 30, how many? 30,000. How many? 30,000. 30,000? 30, yeah. yeah. You're joking. No. It should be it's, our feet. It should be our feet. Yeah. Yeah. It should be our feet. Not bloody us to get two. The Germans are all, we're, all we're getting is that much, and the Germans are getting that, and the Italians are getting that. Yeah. And it's our game. We yeah. want to get in and watch our team go all the way, possibly, right? They're not, they're not going to get the backing that they need. So, so far, yeah. Yeah. good morning, Adam. That's all. Yeah. He's a pain. He's a pain. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know nothing. He's half German. He's half German. That's why the Germans have got more tickets than us. He's half German. Has Franz got a minister for sport? Yeah. Is he good? Does he perform like? Does he get you? Is he? To is he? Like is he any good? French team never got. No, no. But is he? Is he any good? Is he any good? Is he any good? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, if he is, send him to England, cos we need somebody better than Moynihan. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. David, can I have a chat, please? It was time to ask questions. The same man who had allowed me five minutes with Bobby Robson cautiously allowed me behind the bars to talk. Is he with you? Yes. Well, where do you want to do this, then? Anyway, here, it's fine. It's fine. Can you just briefly tell me what's going on? Your goodness all. <laughs> well, it's a very good question. We've just managed to get uh, just over a thousand tickets. It uh, takes a lot of uh, time, effort, trouble, and considerable amount of money to finally extract tickets right. from people. Has it been left late? Well, it's not been left late by us, but it's been left late by the organisers here. Um, what, the Italian entity? Yeah, we well, don't like to point the finger too much, but it, it's it's certainly not our fault. We've been asking for tickets for, for months. Um, a lot of people out there seem to think that this is a result of the directive that has come from the top by our government to um, allocate as few tickets as possible. Um, to uh, the, 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 there's nothing, nothing in that at all. Uh, it's just the case that <coughs> we've asked for tickets and uh, it's only now this relatively late stage of turning up. Do you know how many tickets out. the Germans have been allocated? No, <coughs> I wouldn't think it's too many more than, uh, than no, we've got. got. So how many do you think we'll end up with, uh, in the end, on top one? Just over 2,000. 2,000 tickets. And the stadium holds 
considerably more than that. Which is? I think it's about 80,000. 80,000. Having waited over four hours for our precious tickets, we settled uneasily into campsite Stalag 17. This time an unconverted and disused sports stadium. It felt insecure. There are rumours of Heysel revenge, and the local press had reported that Juventus fans were waiting to strike. I wanted to catch the other semi-final and have a beer, so I drove with Simon and Damien to a quiet mountain village to watch it. That Argentina had reached this semi-final against Italy had become a sick joke, but after extra time and still all square, it was a tense affair for the locals. It was into penalties. Italy had missed their third penalty. The bar was stunned. They needed the next kick to stay in the tournament. When the end did come, the bar was shocked to silence. Italy was never meant to lose. I couldn't share their feelings, but I sort of felt a nervous embarrassment. As the cafe emptied, I couldn't say the same for Simon and Damien. I am so chuffed. Don't worry. Italia. Italia. They're out of their own time in their own country. They deserve it the way they treated the English. That's right, I'm telling you. We're in a happy I mean, I'm sorry alive. for the team tonight, but the fans deserve it. We deserve to be there. We're the happiest men alive at this moment. England. Oh, yes. The next morning, we found ourselves once more in the company of the gentlemen of the press. The smell of trouble must have wafted down to the press centre. What's your name, mate? Darren North. Where are you from? Felton. Is it Feltham? Yeah. Like that? No section. Our premonition had been right. The avenging Juventus fans had attempted a minor assault on the campsite last night. An English guy was apparently stabbed the police lobbed tear gas into the campsite and there'd be momentary panic. Right, so basically what happened was the... Um... The Italians come along and spoiled our party and uh, we just minding our own business. Yeah. But such events were not going to mar what was for many the biggest footballing day they would ever experience. But he's got a lot against that. Like a state event. What? <laughs> Who's your mate? No, but, uh, he, was... Yeah, he was in London. In war, in war time. Was you in what country are you from? To Italiano? Paul? Yes, in Italia. Italian. Yeah. They with us. Where were we in Sheffield? But in Italy, London, London, in London. In uh, Mussolini. I was in England at the time. But you were on our side at the time. <laughs> Which part? Which part of England? London. Yeah. Um, Beckton Gasworks. Beckton? Yes. Gasworks. Gasworks. I work in there. And the family was very kind, very kind to me. Uh, like, like, uh, like in my father, my 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 mother. Is he getting turned? That's what I don't you, you know why? Why? Because I am a, a ticket. I would like to give them. Tickets? Ah. Yes. Have you got tickets? Eh? Have you got tickets? You sure? It's mine. No, oh, you go, you go. Oh, you no, go. no, 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 I don't go because no. I am, no. I, I, I am sick. In your pocket. No. Go on, go on. I am go. sick. No. Take it away. Leave it. I, 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 I give no, 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 no. Oh, you come with us. You come with us. No, no, no. no. I've got a ticket. Look here. Probably the best ticket in there. Yeah. 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 You go to the match and watch England. No, 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 With a ropey Argentina through to the final, people were beginning to realise now that if we could dispatch the Germans in three hours' time, Bobby Robson's England could actually win the 1990 World Cup. I spent the rest of the afternoon with the Jersey boys, Simon and Damien, three Leeds, two Chelsea, 
a couple of Wiggins, and a complete nutter from Knott's Forest, who couldn't be filmed because he was off work sick. I really don't know what some of the lads were on, but the unlikely sound of Pink Floyd oozing from a transit van created an eerie atmosphere. Beating an inform West Germany was going to be a very tall order, and we were nervous. See you. He told me to see the police, and the police says, "Come and see you." Well, show I showed him the ticket. Class two. Class two ticket. He said, "See the police." Yeah. I seen the police, okay. and the police said, "Come and see you." And, and so okay, we were supposed la, to get on. La, they won't let me on the bus. Cuatro A, son los otros, son los primarios. Primarios. Ingresso 4 Quattro sotto, il primo anello. Come fanno loro già a sapere su quale bus devono salire? There must be a label on the bus. The bus driver, why did the bus driver tell us that? Why did the bus driver tell us that? The bus driver told us to see the police, the police told me to see you. Have you ever thought of that? We ought to speak English, shouldn't we? No, we all should speak Italian, maybe. That is some bloody stadium. Two hours to kick off, Colin Moynihan issued his final petty directive. He had apparently seen a Union Jack draped inside the Bologna Stadium with the word bollocks printed on it, and consequently arranged for the Carabinieri to refuse entry to any flag with any word printed on it. Because there's a flag with bollocks written on it, he stopped all flags going in there, there's quite a bit written on it. All flags? Yeah. You can't take your portable flag. No. If it's got nothing written on it, you can take it in. In the pubs, it's been getting better and better and better. And like last week, yeah, the World Cup fever's been building up. And the other night when we were watching Cameroon, we just decided there and then we thought we'd come down with this final. So that's what we that's what we do. We came down and just decided on the spur of the moment to come down. So that's what we've done. And here we are. One of the guys that the Brilliant. 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 What do I make of the whole situation? What here? Well, it seems very peaceful. By the way, this is one of my German friends. Uh -huh. As I say, we cycled over the Alps together. Uh -huh. Good propaganda. Right. England, here we go, here we go. England. Do it for Britain, eh? England? Oh, England. No, yeah, it's all the same, England. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. England. 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 Yeah. London town. Steve Nitch. All right, Steve Nisha. Let's get it right, Dave. What happened in the next 125 minutes is history.
I left the stadium alone. As anyone who has played football will tell you, losing a semi-final is harder to take than losing the final. It was one of the best games of football I'd ever seen. Within the hour, I found myself in what I thought at first to be a riot situation. I left the camera running on the back shelf of the car while I hid behind a tree. As I watched, small groups of English, Italian and Germans engaged in playground-style combat. Squads of Carabinieri flanked by camera crews wandered around and slapped anything that moved with their truncheons. I eventually found my way back to the campsite, where some people were already packing up and preparing to leave. The Carabinieri made a parting gesture by lobbing in more tear gas, and for the second time that night, I cried. Is that a free train in Paris? Is it a free train? Yeah. Is it? That's what they're saying, that's the rumour. That's why they're all getting on it. I'm tempted. Lazy cop won't get up now. I don't know. He won't get up, the lazy kid. <laughs> <coughs> a free train in Paris? Yeah. Let's get rid of him, everyone. Right. Tea. tea is not the word. What was that when you come out of last night's skin? That geezer said. Yeah. Bank up. Yeah. At one consolation, we just could have a nice, decent cup of tea at that. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's the first thing I, when I get home, I just want to have a decent cup of tea. <laughs> and sausage, egg, beans yeah. and chips. And Black pudding. A decent yeah. pint of Mary oh, and bitter. Fried bread. No, yeah. I'm more concerned in having a bath and eating. For, what, you missed home then, do you? Oh, yeah. Now yeah, I miss the luxuries of it. Luxuries? Yeah. Like what? Cups of tea. Is that a luxury? You live with your mum, don't you? Yeah. Clean living. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I can handle sleep. I miss nice. sleeping in a fucking bed. Uh, this is a sign to everybody involved in British football, Colin Moynihan, the government, everybody. See you later, son, all right? See you later. See you later, brother, all right? Thank you. See you later. See you later, Simon. See you later, Simon, anyway. See you later, Kev. See you later, Damien. All right, Paul, yeah. See you later. Have a good journey. 
Chile. See you in Jersey or Sweden. Yeah. Or Poland, maybe. I told Jersey I'd see them later. Maybe. <coughs> the prospect of going to Rome to see Germany play Argentina just didn't appeal to us. Simon and Damien left their knackered van in Bologna and we drove down to Ancona to collect my brother's car, which had been repaired. We didn't even want to watch the final on TV, but somehow we saw it in a bar in the Alps with German-speaking Swiss people wearing the orange strip of Holland and supporting Argentina. Germany won, and I suppose I deserved it. Mark Wright. Paul Gaskin. I don't know who said it, but there's a saying that goes something like this. A patriot is someone who loves his country, and a nationalist is someone who hates everyone else's. A bit close to that. Up front, yeah? Yeah. As the many miles to Calais clicked by, we each in turn picked our very own International World Cup 11 and started making tentative plans for the 1994 finals. Football in America. It's a funny old game.